Once, the financial world was captivated by the brilliance of Charles Ponzi, the mastermind behind one of America's most prosperous business ventures. With millions of dollars at his fingertips and throngs of eager individuals clamoring to invest, Ponzi seemed unstoppable. What the world didn't realize, however, was that Ponzi's empire was built on a foundation of deceit. His entire operation was an audacious scam, unknown to those who trusted him with their money. Ponzi's fraudulent scheme made him immensely wealthy, but left thousands of innocent lives in ruin. His deception was so shocking and notorious that even a century later, the scam he orchestrated bears his name, the Ponzi scheme. This video delves into the untold truth about the man behind the scam and reveals the astonishing tale of making millions from nothing but lies. Born in Italy on March 3, 1882, Ponzi hailed from a family with a history of financial prosperity. His father, a diligent postman, provided a comfortable upbringing. However, Ponzi's family background was once far wealthier. His grandparents and great-grandparents were all accomplished entrepreneurs, merchants, and public officials. The shift to the working class deeply impacted Ponzi during his formative years, leaving him embittered and resentful. He questioned why he had to bear the consequences of his family's declining fortunes and yearned for a life of affluence without the burden of work or financial worries. In his teenage years, Ponzi received a modest inheritance following his father's passing. While his mother had aspirations for him to attend a prestigious college and gain an education, Ponzi had different intentions. Instead of investing in his studies, he squandered his money on fashionable attire, lavish dining experiences, and extravagant outings with wealthy companions. Ponzi indulged in a facade of opulence, pretending to be as affluent as his friends, even partaking in activities like theater, opera, and casino gambling. This illusion, however, came crashing down when his inheritance dwindled away. Neglecting his studies entirely, Ponzi had no prospect of graduating from college. Although his uncle extended an offer of employment as a clerk, Ponzi rejected the idea, deeming such mundane work beneath him. Faced with limited options, he made a pivotal decision. He would travel to America in pursuit of striking it rich. In 1903, Ponzi arrived in Boston aboard the SS Vancouver, overwhelmed by the shame of having disappointed his mother. He was convinced that the only way to redeem himself was to return to Italy as a wealthy man. However, there was a significant hurdle. He had no idea how to achieve this goal. America served as a harsh reality check for the young Ponzi. His inheritance had dwindled, and there were no more relatives to bail him out. Despite his aversion to physical labor, he had no choice but to work if he wanted to survive. Over the next few years, he moved up and down the East Coast, taking on various jobs such as sign painter, waiter, grocery clerk, dishwasher, factory worker, insurance salesman, and sewing machine repairman. None of these positions lasted long. He either quit due to dissatisfaction or was fired for attempting to deceive customers. Often, he resorted to theft or begging for food, and he slept in parks, a stark contrast to his carefree days as a high roller in Rome. Even when Ponzi managed to accumulate some money, he would squander it on extravagant nights out or weekend getaways to relive his past. In 1907, Ponzi traveled to Montreal, hoping for better opportunities in Canada. Initially, things seemed promising when he found a job as a clerk at a bank catering to Italian immigrants, Banco Zarossi. It was the same kind of work he had rejected in Rome, but his perspective had changed after years of street life and low-wage jobs. Unfortunately, his employment at the bank was short-lived. His boss, Zarossi, was running a fraudulent scheme, using money from new clients to pay off older ones. Despite offering attractive 6% interest rates, Suspicions arose among clients whose relatives in Italy did not receive the expected funds. When authorities began investigating the bank for embezzlement in mid-1908, Zarossi fled to Mexico, leaving Ponzi and others to deal with the fallout. To avoid being implicated in the investigation, Ponzi planned to return to the United States. However, he made a foolish decision before leaving. In an attempt to give himself a financial boost, Ponzi forged a check from one of his bank's clients, the Canadian Warehousing Company. Although he thought the amount of 423 
$58, seemed inconspicuous. The bank teller quickly identified the fake signature and alerted the police. Ponzi was sentenced to three years in prison at St. Vincent de Paul Penitentiary, marking just the beginning of his criminal activities. Released on parole after two years, Ponzi quickly made plans to return to the United States. However, he didn't travel alone. He brought five Italian immigrants with him, all lacking proper papers. Ponzi had been paid to smuggle these men into America, hoping for a substantial payday. Unfortunately, he got caught and was arrested once again. Despite his hopes that pleading guilty would lead to a lenient sentence, Ponzi's optimism faded when the judge sentenced him to another two years in federal prison in Atlanta. Upon his second release from jail, Ponzi found himself uncertain about his future. Despite formulating various plans to amass wealth during his time in prison, he lacked the funds to put any of them into action. With few options, he wandered from state to state, taking whatever odd jobs came his way. Eventually, he secured a decent position as a clerk with an import-export business called the J.R. Pool Company in Boston. After 15 years in North America, he found himself back where he had started in Boston. This time, however, things seemed better for Ponzi. He excelled at his job and was even promoted. Additionally, he met 21-year-old Rose Necco and quickly fell in love with her. The feeling was mutual, and the two got married in early 1918. While Ponzi found happiness in his married life, he also felt inadequate. Despite Rose's contentment with a simple life, Ponzi had grander ambitions. He desired to shower her with luxuries such as diamond rings, fancy clothes, and extravagant holidays. Realizing he could not achieve this on a clerk's salary, Ponzi quit his job at J.R. Poole six months after their wedding. He attempted to enter the business world by joining his father-in-law's struggling wholesale fruit-selling business. Despite boasting about his financial acumen, Ponzi was unable to save the failing enterprise, which eventually went bankrupt. Undeterred by his recent failure, Ponzi rented a small office and started his own import-export business. However, he struggled to attract attention due to his lack of experience and connections. Ponzi, refusing to accept that he was the problem, believed that advertising his services more aggressively could be the solution. Unfortunately, the high costs of advertising proved prohibitive. Nevertheless, this failure sparked an idea. Ponzi decided to publish his own trade magazine, The Trader's Guide. He calculated that sending the magazine for free to 100,000 companies, doubling the circulation number with each new issue, would generate significant advertising income. Despite his lack of publishing experience, Ponzi believed he had stumbled upon a million-dollar business idea. He anticipated an initial mailing cost of around $35,000, but expected to make $80,000 in advertising income, assuming companies would be eager to feature their services in his magazine. Confident in his success, Ponzi rented a larger office, hired three staff members, and began writing to investors and business owners about the opportunity to be part of the first issue of The Trader's Guide. However, Ponzi's optimism was shattered when reality hit when nobody showed interest in his obscure trade magazine, and companies were unwilling to pay his high advertising rates. Facing financial ruin and desperate for a solution, Ponzi stumbled upon a letter from Spain in his mail. In his earlier vision of The Trader's Guide becoming a global success, Ponzi had intended to expand his business into Europe, translating the magazine into French, German, Italian, Spanish, and Portuguese. He had contacted various foreign companies about potential collaborations, and it seemed that at least one Spanish author was interested. The author requested a copy of The Trader's Guide and included something Ponzi had never seen before, an international reply coupon, IRC. These prepaid coupons, exchangeable for postage stamps in any member country of the Universal Postal Union, were typically used for international correspondence, covering the cost of return postage. For Ponzi, this seemingly ordinary coupon sparked inspiration and would soon change his life forever. Ponzi exploited the concept of arbitrage, the strategy of buying and selling an asset in different markets to capitalize on price differences and make a profit. In the case of international reply coupons, 
IRCs, they always had the same postage value regardless of the country, but their prices varied based on fluctuations in local currencies. Ponzi envisioned buying IRCs in countries with weaker currencies and redeeming them in countries with stronger currencies, thereby making a profit. He believed he could scale this operation to generate significant income. Ponzi founded a company named the Securities Exchange Company in January 1920 to execute this plan legally. However, the reality was far from his expectations. The profits from IRC arbitrage were minuscule and were wiped out by the costs of shipping the IRCs across countries. There were simply not enough IRCs worldwide to sustain Ponzi's envisioned operation. Despite the impracticality of his plan, Ponzi clung to the idea convinced it could lead him to immense wealth. Determined to make his vision a reality, Ponzi started his own company, the Securities Exchange Company, in January 1920. He promised investors significant returns by exploiting the price differences in IRCs. Ponzi claimed to have a vast network of agents worldwide, buying IRCs in bulk and shipping them to the United States for profit. However, the scheme was unsustainable due to the logistical challenges and lack of profitability. In the face of mounting obstacles, Ponzi refused to abandon his plan. Ponzi's scheme resembled the classic fraud of robbing Peter to pay Paul. He lured people into investing by promising high returns in a short time with minimal risk. In reality, the money invested was not used for any legitimate purpose. Instead, it was used to pay earlier investors, creating an illusion of profit. Ponzi targeted individuals lacking financial literacy, often desperate for quick money, and exploited their greed and naivety. Despite the obvious impracticality of his plan, Ponzi managed to attract investors by promising extraordinary returns. Using his persuasion skills, Ponzi convinced people in his neighborhood to invest in his scheme. As word spread about the substantial profits, thousands of investors flocked to invest in Ponzi's operation. Ponzi's clientele grew rapidly, and at the peak of his scheme, he was raking in over $250,000 a day. Ponzi's scheme continued to flourish as he expanded his client base. He lived a luxurious lifestyle, residing in a mansion, driving expensive cars, wearing extravagant clothes and jewelry, and embarking on lavish trips. However, Ponzi's success was short-lived. Doubts about the legitimacy of his operation began to surface, and investigations into his business practices commenced. The Boston Post, with the help of financial experts, exposed Ponzi's fraudulent scheme in July 1920. Despite Ponzi's efforts to cooperate with the authorities, his downfall came when he hired an honest publicist, William McMasters, who revealed Ponzi's true nature. McMasters gathered evidence and exposed Ponzi's secrets in an award-winning expose published by the Boston Post. The Ponzi scheme collapsed, leading to multiple bank bankruptcies and the loss of life savings for tens of thousands of investors. Ponzi was indicted on 86 counts of mail fraud, but ultimately pleaded guilty to a single charge, receiving a relatively lenient five-year prison sentence considering the vast amount of money he had stolen and the extensive impact on people's lives. After serving three and a half years in prison, Ponzi was released but far from turning over a new leaf, he immediately delved into another fraudulent scheme. Aware of the government's intentions to either deport him to Italy or imprison him again on larceny charges, Ponzi fled to Florida. There, he attempted to replicate the Ponzi scam by establishing a new company called Sharp on Lands Indica. Ponzi sought investors for supposedly valuable properties around Jacksonville, promising astronomical returns up to 200% in just 60 days. However, the catch was that the properties he was selling were utterly worthless swamplands. Unfortunately for Ponzi, this time he found no takers. Soon enough, Ponzi's fraud was exposed and he risked being sent back to Massachusetts, where a lengthy prison sentence awaited him. Desperate to evade capture, Ponzi changed his appearance and attempted to escape to Italy by posing as a sailor on a cargo ship. However, his attempt failed when he was recognized and arrested in New Orleans. Facing dire circumstances, Ponzi wrote appeals to President Calvin Coolidge 
and even Mussolini, seeking mercy and intervention, but his pleas fell on deaf ears. This marked the end of the line for Ponzi. He served another seven years in prison, during which time he underwent a profound transformation. The man who emerged from prison was a broken individual, devoid of the charm and confidence that had once made him so successful. As he faced deportation to Italy, his wife chose to stay in America, ultimately divorcing him. Ponzi spent his remaining years in abject poverty, haunted by memories of his past wealth. He ended up in Rio de Janeiro, where he died in 1949 in a charity hospital. His death marked the final chapter of one of the most notorious tales of rags to riches to rags in history. Thank you for joining us on this journey through the fascinating life of Charles Ponzi, the infamous mastermind behind the Ponzi scheme. If you enjoyed this video and found it insightful, don't forget to hit the subscribe button, give us a thumbs up, and ring that notification bell so you never miss out on our intriguing content. Stay tuned for more gripping stories and historical insights. Until next time, stay curious and keep exploring.